Right. So today we're going to continue uh, with uh, the different ISIC groups. Uh, so last time we saw beetles, we saw bees and wasp, and then we saw flies, and uh, one more, that was it. Oh, and the bugs, the true bugs, as well as uh, the homoptera, which is the order that is going to have only plant feeding insects. So out of all of those groups, the homoptera will be the one that if you're growing any plant, you're gonna face some problems, you're gonna deal with some issues or some uh, bugs. Uh, so today we get to see a few other uh, uh, plant insect groups. Uh, some of them are gonna be a little bit more obscure, uh, but some of them are gonna be very common like uh, the butterfly. So now we're looking at the order uh, Lepidoptera, uh, and uh, just to translate the name, lepis uh, means uh, a scale. Uh, and that is making the reference to this image that uh, we took with that microscope, uh, the different scales that are covering uh, the wings of the butterfly. Uh, the scales are fragile, and so that's why whenever you hold a butterfly, uh, you are always going to get some coloring on your fingers. Those are all the scales that just uh, broke off from their wings and uh, they go on your finger. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. And uh, Aptera wing, so Lepidoptera scales on the wing. So all butterflies are going to have this. And so this group is going to be represented by the butterflies and the moths. Uh, and we like to think that butterflies are going to be the colorful individuals that are going to be diurnal, which means they come out during the daytime and they fly around. Uh, and uh, the moths are going to be primarily nocturnal, so they will come out during the night. And I'm saying primarily because there will be some moths that will come during the, uh, during the daytime and a few butterflies that may get cut during the night uh, but pretty much uh, in the general sense that is kind of a very good description if you see it flying uh, during the night it's probably a moth but we'll look at some of the characteristics that you can see uh, look for to separate uh, the two individuals so we get the scale uh, from uh, uh, from the insect uh, right here with another image of a close-up so you can see the scales right here and that's, uh, they're gonna reflect the heat, the light. Uh, and so that's why they're gonna have some really nice colorful pattern. Uh, and this is gonna be the juvenile stage. So they do have a complete uh, change, complete metamorphosis. Uh, now we're gonna call the juvenile stage a caterpillar. Uh, the caterpillar that is gonna be the period where the insect is gonna cause some damage. Uh, caterpillars only have one job, and that is to eat. Uh, they have to eat a lot of plant material in order for them to gain enough calories and enough vitamins, minerals to grow and complete their life cycle. And they are going to eat almost every hour of the day. And uh, if a couple of caterpillars or certain groups don't eat within an hour, uh, they say that they can literally starve to death uh, because they have to keep eating. Uh, and so defoliation, attacking some of the stems can be a big problem with some caterpillars. Uh, and one of the best ways, or one of the ways that people normally deal with caterpillars is gonna be through the use of a, a biological product called a BT, uh, B as in letter B and then T which uh, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And that is gonna be a uh, bacteria spore uh, that you spray on the plant, on uh, the leaves, it's safe for people. And when the caterpillars eats the leaf that has the spore, then the spore is gonna uh, grow in their stomach and the stomach is gonna be destroyed and the caterpillar will then starve to death or die of a uh, destruction of the stomach. So BT uh, would be one of the 
ways that you can use to control the caterpillars organically. And that is gonna be during the caterpillar stage. That is not gonna affect the adult butterflies because the adult butterflies are gonna not have the diet of eating the leaves. Question? Okay, good. So here's, uh, here's where the caterpillars can do a serious damage. So the other thing that is gonna be important for you to understand with uh, a lot of the caterpillars uh, and a lot of the butterflies is that many are gonna have a specific host. So they're only gonna feed on a specific group of plants or a specific plant uh, that over the course of millions of years, they have evolved either to extract some of the toxic, toxic compounds as in the case of the monarchs and milkweed. And over time, they are kind of become dependent on one another where the butterfly is then going to look for those specific chemicals because that is what's gonna make them safe or they're gonna make them not taste good or not, not palatable for birds or other predators. Uh, and so the question always, uh, that, the suggestion that I always recommend, if you don't wanna deal with caterpillars, then find out what is that, that specific plant that they feed on and just don't grow that plant and you're safe. You're never gonna get those caterpillars. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna have to be a tolerance. I know that many people love butterflies and many people love to see them, like to invite them into the garden. They put plants that are, produce nectar for butterflies, but you also have to put the caterpillar food because that's a lot more important. Keeping in mind that most butterflies that you're gonna find here in Southern California have an adult life of about one week. So that is the whole time, uh, that is the time the butterfly has to find a mate, uh, then find that specific host plant, lay their eggs, and then they die. And so the rest of the time is gonna be that caterpillar that's gonna be feeding, eating, and uh, living the life. So be aware of that. Uh, so do not grow those plants. Some caterpillars may have hairs that could be a little bit uh, rough. They can sting. Uh, so be careful in, uh, if you're gonna be handling them, uh, such as the case with uh, this little group there. And, or I was able to take this uh, Drya Julia or Julia butterfly in front of an anaconda right here for scale. Uh, in Brazil, I was taking the uh, uh, the anaconda, the butterfly just happened to be right there. Uh, and or we have some of the, what they refer to as the hookworm. Uh, you have uh, this group of caterpillars. Uh, you can see their legs. You can see this one eating. Uh, the coloration is just a warning sign for predators. We know that black and red on caterpillars uh, and butterflies, a warning sign, and birds, and a bunch of other things. But sometimes you're going to have an extension, kind of like a little tail, that it's going to act as a distraction for uh, the predator. So important thing will be the head. If the head is destroyed, damaged, obviously that animal is going to die. So if it happens to try to bite the tail first, then the caterpillar may have a chance of surviving. Uh, so that's when you see some of this, like the hookworms, uh, that would be that. Or sometimes the caterpillars are going to camouflage themselves as bird poop or bird dropping. Uh, so this one with this pattern, that is what it's trying to mimic. Obviously, there's uh, very few things I like to eat the poop of birds. So it's a perfect camouflage, a perfect disguise uh, for this to hide because some of them are tasty. Uh, wasps, as I mentioned, require that protein. And when you see wasps going around plants, they're looking for caterpillars. They're looking for the protein for any other insects that they can catch, kill, and feed it to their younger sisters. And so hiding is important. Yes? Uh, the front is over here where you see the jaw, right here. Uh, 
<laughs> you must be seeing things, but it kind of does look like that. <laughs> I, I, I've never noticed that. <laughs> and the paws look like a bear. <laughs> Uh, and or here's uh, one of the biggest uh, caterpillars that I've encountered. Uh, this one is in Brazil. And uh, when we found it uh, and we tried to put the hand for scale, uh, the caterpillar swung back and forth, uh, guessing that if it would have gotten the hand, it would have bitten. Uh, when they're big, their mandibles could be strong enough to cause some kind of jaw bite. Uh, I would, out of doubt, they're gonna drop blood, but it's a defense mechanism. Uh, it did that. So this is one of those uh, hookworm type uh, caterpillar. Huh? What is that? What is that? What? Into a moth. Mm -hmm. One of those big moths. Right? Huh? There's a scale of a hand right there. Oh, one of those, either the Atlas moth or the lunar moth, so the bigger one. So there's a step. Oh, so there's a caterpillar when it was resting. Uh, and so here's uh, what's gonna happen. So then they're gonna go through the chrysalis stage. So this is where uh, we also need to define the difference between a cocoon and a chrysalis. Uh, all caterpillars are gonna create a chrysalis. That is gonna be their resting stage that will then emerge as the adult and uh, then they're gonna fly. If the chrysalis is surrounded or covered or has an extra protection of silk, then that becomes the cocoon. So, but they're all inside the cocoon, there's the chrysalis, but some uh, moths and or butterflies may use that extra silk as an extra protection uh, for during the uh, larvae, uh, during the, the pupa stage, which is gonna be where they're just defenseless, they cannot move, they are uh, changing. And so that's the difference, chrysalis versus cocoon. Cocoons have a covering of uh, silk that it gives them extra protection. Uh, and so the caterpillar is going to emerge as an adult. And uh, the butterfly, uh, which I mentioned where the daylight or night diurnal, uh, you can recognize them by having this kind of club-like antenna, okay? So the antenna is going to play a vital role. Uh, so that's going to detect some of the chemical signals uh, from other butterflies or some of the chemical signals uh, from the plants. Uh, many butterflies do have very well-developed sight that they can look at different plants and determine which one is the one that is gonna be the right one for them. Uh, so when you look at this uh, club-like, uh, very narrow and then a little bit uh, thicker towards the tip, then that is gonna be a typical antenna for a butterfly. So that's the clear wing. Uh, this is uh, just a, a blue one. Uh, and once again, you can see that this very slender antenna uh, the two wings here just reflecting the, the blue. Uh, another caterpillar sleeping, one of those hawk moths, or this one has the proboscis. So butterflies and or moths have a proboscis. Uh, very long, very narrow. And uh, one of the important, the other important thing that you need to know is that when you're looking at the life cycle of the insect, we're talking about complete or incomplete, complete metamorphosis, incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, when the insect has the complete metamorphosis, they are, uh, they are considered to be more advanced. And the reason for that is because during the juvenile stage, the caterpillar eats leaves and eats plants. And during the adult stage, the adult feeds on pollen and nectar. So in the same habitat, the two individuals are not gonna compete with one another. Whereas when you have the incomplete, like the bugs, the adult and the juveniles feed on the same thing. And so adults, if there's lots of them, they can outcompete the juvenile and the juveniles are not gonna have a chance to make it. 
Uh, and so proboscis, because butterflies are gonna have mainly a liquid diet of uh, nectar. And in the process of uh, collecting the nectar, they can also get some protein uh, from the pollen. Uh, so pollen and nectar, and that's why they go around looking for flowers as the adult uh, find a mate, lay eggs, and then they die. And then the caterpillars continue the cycle. Uh, just another caterpillar here, some of the not bigger ones that I found. So this one has uh, the two colors on its antennae, but it shows you the clear uh, view of uh, kind of this golden part here that is a little bit thicker versus uh, the first part. And then when the proboscis is not in use, uh, metamorphosis, that's a movie. Uh, uh, it's a uh, rolled uh so that it's kind of tucked away so that it's not going to interfere it's not going to get in the way as the butterfly is moving and then when it's time for it to use she will unfurl it and uh, uh try to probe the flowers for the nectar uh the other thing that you can see uh, depending on the species of butterfly when at rest some butterflies are going to hold their wings upright whereas others are going to hold them uh, kind of to the side that's not as a big indicator, but you can see that uh, uh, with different ones. Uh, this one is a caterpillar that apparently is a very poisonous. And uh, this one, I found it in Chiapas, Mexico, and it kind of came close to it. And I took a photograph. And then uh, later on, when I showed it to uh, uh, Philip, which is a uh, butterfly whisperer, uh, he said, oh, no, that's, that's extremely poisonous. If you would have got touched uh, the hairs, it would have been not good for you. It's like, oh, interesting. Sounds good. So I guess there are such a thing as uh, poisonous uh, butterflies or caterpillars. And uh, there's also something that most people don't realize. There are also carnivorous caterpillars. Like 99.9% .9 of all caterpillars are going to be vegetarians, but there are a few uh, isolated in uh, islands that instead of uh, eating uh, leaves or plants, they will catch other insects or other caterpillars and they will eat them. So they can also eat, uh, some can eat each other and or some can eat other insects. So, so there are predatory carnivorous caterpillars. Uh, it's just a, a yellow one, uh, just kind of take uh, resting. Uh, some green ones, uh, when you see this uh, extension of the wings, those are going to be commonly known as the swallowtail butterfly. And there's a specific group of those. And here's the, the moth. So this one being the tiger moth. So now what is the difference? If you look at their antennae, the antennae is going to look like a feather. So there's going to be a lot more receptors because the moths are not going to use their eyes to find a mate or a partner. They come out during the nighttime. And so they're going to rely on the chemical signals. They're going to rely on the moon to kind of maneuver and guide themselves through the environment. And then as they pick up the signals from the pheromones of a potential mate, then they're going to fly towards the direction. And that's how they're going to communicate with one another. So having more receptors is going to be very, very important. And so if you find a moth or a butterfly looking thing and it has antennae that look like a feather then you know that that is a moth and not a butterfly so club-like butterfly feather-like uh, moth because some moth can also be very beautiful and very colorful so you cannot say yeah moths are drab yeah, many of them are but some of them can be quite nice and beautiful and colorful and the same thing with but some butterflies are kind of not, not all of them are pretty and colorful. But some of those features are going to be important. Uh, this one is a tiger moth. You find it around here. And the uh, best place, look for those uh, light bulbs. They assume that's the moon. They don't know any better. And uh, that's when they kind of try to fly and go towards uh, the moon and they kind of hit the wall. And it's, it's an ugly thing, but uh, it happens. So look for light bulbs and you can find many of these moths there. Uh, caterpillar, you're just eating uh, one of those hookworms and there's the hook uh, that is uh, showing you and there's uh, the face 
uh, in the legs that is holding. And there is a face with uh, a little more stronger jaws or tight knives uh, just to be able to chew and keep on chewing. Uh, here's uh, a skipper butterfly. And uh, here you can see the proboscis that has been unfurled. It's uh, probing the flowers for uh, the nectar. And the skippers are also found here and they're known as skippers because they kind of, as they fly, they look like they're skipping. Uh, and uh, that's another thing. So the, the mechanism is to try to fool the animal. These are delicious. And so by skipping, it confuses the animal and, uh, and, and it allows it to escape. Whereas butterflies that are poisonous don't do that. They kind of fly in a straight pattern because they know that they're not going to be touched by a, a predator. Uh, so skipper, they're going to be the smaller, but not the smaller, but, but it's going to be a small butterfly around here. Uh, and that's a video of it probing. This is the club antenna right there. And then it went away. Uh, so here's uh, some of the eggs in uh, the newly hatched individuals. So the plants, uh, the caterpillars, the butterflies are gonna lay the eggs either on the plant or in close proximity. Uh, the first thing that the caterpillars are gonna eat when they hatch is gonna be their eggshell. It's a lot of protein. There's a lot of good vitamins and minerals. So they're gonna eat their, uh, the shell and that's gonna allow them to mold a couple of times, grow, now get a stronger jaw. And when they're not small, they may just skeletonize the leaf of a plant because the jaw is not too strong yet. Some of the fibers, some of the base of the plant might be too tough. Uh, but as they get older and their jaws become uh, stronger, then they can defoliate the plant. Then they can also eat the stems. Then they can also devour an entire plant. Uh, but that is going to happen over the course of time as the caterpillars uh, grow. Uh, and then uh, when it's time for them to pupate, they're going to move away from the plant because predators who know that there's caterpillars or butterflies in this area know the plants as well. So they're gonna walk away from the plant, find a safe area where they're gonna pupate, they're gonna usually hang, uh, and that's when they're gonna carry out their life cycle. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people do is when they see a caterpillar walking around, like, oh, you poor thing, you're lost. And they pick it up and put it back to the plant when the caterpillar wants to be a way to hide and pupate. So if you see a caterpillar, trust me, if they're gonna be eating, they're not gonna move away from the plant. If they're moving away from the plant is because they're looking for a safe place to pupate. So do not put him back, let him do his thing. Uh, this one completed his life cycle or this uh, pupa stage in uh, two, about less than two weeks. So we collected it from the field. It's a passion flower butterfly. And then we saw the caterpillar, then we lost the caterpillar, and then we find the pupa. And before we left, we were able to see uh, the butterfly emerge. So we saw the entire process here. Uh, here's some of the moths. And so these are the Luna moths or the Luna types. Uh, you can buy them from uh, uh, different butterfly growers. Uh, they sell you the cocoon. So here's the cocoon cover in uh, fibers. And uh, these are just from butterfly houses where they would hang them. And then when they emerge, uh, then they'll uh, be displayed. Uh, it is very important for them to have a lot of space because the moment they come out from the chrysalis, their wings are very fragile. 
And uh, if they don't, if they expand and they hit something, they get permanent damage and then uh, they're not gonna work. Uh, so it is good if you're gonna raise butterflies that you put, give them a lot of room so that they can expand their wings. They can then dry them out. And as soon as they dry out and expand it and rigid, then they're able to fly. Uh, so different types of Luna moths or uh, moths for sale. Uh, another type of uh, uh, swallowtail here, uh, that is the passion vine butterfly laying its eggs. So you can see the egg right here. Uh, you can see it is laying. Uh, we gotta make sure that it's in the right area. And uh, this one likes to lay their eggs on the tip because that is where there's more vitamins and minerals. And then you have the caterpillars at different stages, some of them already devouring uh, the leaves. Uh, this is the sphinx moth. So some of those uh, caterpillars that have the hookworm or the hook would turn into some kind of sphinx moth like this. Uh, we do have sphinx moths around here in Southern California. They're the size of a hummingbird. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you're lucky, they do come out before sunset. And oftentimes they are confused by people and they think that it's a hummingbird because uh, they can also hover and they will just be going from flower to flower. Uh, so Sphinx moth uh, would be one that if you can be on the lookout for, but sometimes you may find it already dead. Uh, and this is what they refer to as uh, the Atlas type moth. And these are gonna be some of the bigger ones. So most likely that caterpillar that you saw the big one will probably turn into something like this. Uh, so Atlas moth, uh, and you have this feathery antenna. Uh, and this one just happened to land on one of our, our friends when we were out there looking for insects. Uh, and then you have a group of butterfly that are gonna be kind of whitish or grayish in color. This is just a very generic uh, family known as uh, Nactuidae. Kind of nocturnal butterfly. If it's gray, if it's drab, if it looks like not exciting, then it's probably a nocturnal moth, or very often it is. Uh, and so this one was just uh, laying uh, on the sun, on the light. Uh, or here's just another one, not a clear picture, so let's skip it. Uh, just different uh, nocturnal moths that uh, you just came up to the light uh, during the nighttime. Uh, so like that. Uh, and or this one here, or that one, uh, this one has an extension of the forehead. Uh, so this, this is from South America. Or here's a butterfly, another swallowtail side view. Uh, there's a, the monarch with the proboscis, uh, the mouth part. Uh, you can see the claws uh, here that we've seen before on other insects that shows you how they can grip and hold on. Uh, here's more nocturnal moths. And uh, here's another one that is also very hairy. Uh, I don't even see the face, but there's another very large caterpillar. Uh, there you go. Uh, or this is the zebra long wing. Uh, so those spikes are not dangerous, but you can, it could be a bluff or just as a warning sign. Uh, or here's another caterpillar and another one and the eggs laid on the growing tip of plants. Uh, just another moth, moth right there. Moth, 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 moth. Uh, that's also a moth. And that's a moth right there. And that's a moth. Side view of the moth. This one to me looks like a birdie. So there's a beak, there's a face. And there's the front view, uh, medieval moth. And so here's beautiful antenna right here, feathery. Uh, that's a dead moth. Uh, that's a caterpillar that was um, almost flat. And there's the, the frass uh, moth, passion vine butterfly from here, uh, passion vine butterfly. A lot of eggs on the tips. And uh, here's where this, uh, we got a chance to visit a butterfly farm uh, in uh, Ecuador. So they were raising passion vine butterflies. And uh, when they shipped them to the butterfly gardens through Europe, 
in uh, the different parts of the world, they'll ship the crystals like this. Uh, and uh, this is how they get some of the parents to just lay their eggs and then they take the, lead, the eggs, put them in a different area and then raise out the caterpillars to the pupa stage. And these are their, uh, the, I guess the cages, we're gonna call them cages, uh, but this is where they're raising them. They'll keep on putting food because they have to keep eating and then uh, change them, sell them, and then move on. Uh, Morpho butterfly, the blue one, another swallowtail, another moth. This one looks like a dead leaf, and that's another thing. Remember, mimicry, trying to hide. So if it looks like a dead leaf, nobody's gonna bother it. Uh, it even has some of uh, somebody that chewed or bite it, uh, or some mimicry so good that it has uh, some of the damage as well. Uh, looks like a moth, that medieval moth, uh, butterfly. Uh, that is the monkey, monkey moth. So if it turns around, it looks like a monkey. Uh, and that's going to be a fright mechanism. So if it sees a bird coming down to it, it may flutter its wings, expose the uh, uh, marking. Uh, and uh, it's uh, reflect the light. And if it bird thinks there's some bigger animal there, it might not attack. So that's uh, that's why you might have might have seen you may have some of these patterns on some of those animals. Uh, caterpillar. Uh, this is the banana slug uh, caterpillar. Uh, that's more passion vine. That's uh, the bird poop caterpillar. We do have something like this here on citrus. So if you look at citrus, uh, citrus plant, uh, you can find something similar to this, uh, the bird poop uh, caterpillar. Uh, there it is. Uh, some uh, other butterfly just feeding on the flowers, more eggs, different caterpillars. Uh, there's another long wing. And uh, this is another important thing that people who like butterflies or wanna invite butterflies into the garden, they also have to provide water. Uh, and so whenever you see butterflies, it is not uncommon for them to be in moist soil or mud, or if they ever land on you, you can watch them drink your sweat. Uh, so they are probing for water. They are probing for some minerals. In your case, their sweat also has some salt, uh, which they like. Uh, and so water, having a moist area, wet area for them to drink is also going to be important. Caterpillar, uh, another caterpillar on the Rudecchia. Uh, this is the morning cloak. And this is the one that you grow around here. Uh, you find around here uh, feeding on willows. So you find willows, look closely, and you may find uh, this individual used to be here. Uh, we saw it in very large numbers when we had a whipping willow in the center of the garden. And you can see devour leaves, completely devour. Uh, it turns into a very nice butterfly. Another of the uh, Atlas moth, but I want to point out that the tips looks like a snake. And so this is where when it's at rest, it's going to look like a snake. So there's the face of the snake, the bottom, there's the eye. And I'll show you the resting position later on. And so a bird is going to have to make a decision. It could be a delicious butterfly or it could be a snake. It could be a delicious meal or it could be the end of your life. Which one are you going to choose? Uh, and so that's, it's a mimicry, it helps, it protects them. Uh, it's another moth, uh, and I'm not sure of this one, which one that is, butterfly, butterfly, skipper, skipper, uh, the morning cloak on willows. Uh, and then this is the yucca moth. Uh, and this is the one you find here in Southern California in association to the yucca or coastal uh, yucca, chaparral yucca, our Lord's candle. And this is where now another of those one-to-one -one relationship where this is the rifle pollinator of yucca moth. And over many millions of years, they've evolved to uh, help one another. So this is, uh, the butterfly is gonna lay her eggs in the ovaries of the yucca flower and then it's gonna deliberately uh, pollinate the flower. So she has a special compartment where she carries the pollen and she'll pollinate the flower. 
And then as the seeds from the yucca develop, some of the caterpillars from the moth are gonna eat them, uh, but they're not all gonna be destroyed. So the moth gets to have its uh, younglings uh, fed while the yucca gets to have pollinations and many seeds that will still be viable and will be dispersed. So this is the rifle one. So if you find yucca, look for this uh, moth. And this is from Griffith Park. Uh, so it's around here, wherever you see the yucca uh, plant. So yucca plant, yucca moth, one-to-one -one relationship with one another. Similar to uh, monarchs and milkweed. So there's the yucca moth with a bunch of other flies. And this is uh, as the caterpillar starting to change and becoming those the chrysalis. So that's gonna happen completely defenseless now. Uh, there's some of the sphinx moths that you find around here. This one's obviously mating uh, and or uh, the monarchs butterflies that we also have around here that obviously are gonna be important for the milkweed because that's what they're gonna be able to eat. Uh, so monarch, uh, this looks like a moth, a swallowtail butterfly, uh, the sphinx moth. Uh, I think this is the red admiral that you also find around here or the admiral. Uh, that's the monarch and that's the monarch chrysalis, easy to recognize. And there's uh, the leftover of the body of the caterpillar once it became the chrysalis. And this is uh, from uh, Michoacan. So this is the, one of the monarch sanctuary that I recorded some of the plants that they were feeding on. Uh, so this is a sage uh, that they like. And uh, this is another mimic. It looks like a wasp. It uh, has a color of a wasp. Uh, but remember when I mentioned before or last time that wasp has a very slender waistline. Uh, this one does not. And uh, if you look at the wings, they have those uh, uh, scales. Uh, so this is a moth that is trying to look like a wasp for protection. This is also coming around here and it also grows on willows or feeds on willows, but it's gonna be more of a uh, stem feeder. So the eggs are laid in the stem of the plant. And uh, when the butter a butterfly is ready, then uh, it's gonna come out. So I have the chrysalis or uh, the shell, and then uh, it came out and I was able to take a photograph. Uh, the clear wing butterfly here feeding on daisy. And uh, this is the, the monarch sanctuary. So, yep, there's a lot of butterflies. You stepped on them, they were dead, they were on the ground, they were everywhere. And this is just one of the sanctuaries. There are multiple ones. Uh, there's one that are sought after by the tourists. We try to avoid that one. At least the one that one was uh, had a problem with the road, so we couldn't go to it. So this is another sanctuary. Uh, and so the monarch obviously got the fame for their migration, uh, the length. Uh, so they head on down to Michoacan, uh, many of them, and then that's when they spend the winter and then they fly back. Uh, so if you ever get a chance, it's a very good uh, opportunity or very good to see uh, that sanctuary for the monarch. Uh, it's a butterfly right there, more eggs, uh, just caterpillars devouring uh, the stems, butterfly, uh, side view of the butterfly, and then uh, the close-up of uh, the club antenna uh, right there. I guess it looks like a golf club. Hmm? A golf club. And the eye and the hairs, uh, butterfly, butterfly, uh, moth, uh, butterfly, swallowtail, swallowtail side view, 
uh, caterpillar um, uh, pupa for chrysalis for monarch skipper and that's it all right so that's uh, butterflies and moths so then the next one that we're going to see is going to be the orthoptera which are going to be the grasshoppers and the crickets crickets and grasshoppers uh, orthoptera means a uh, straight and uh, optera means wings so straight wings because when they're at rest, they are going to be straight in the back, uh, in their back. Uh, and so here we have the grasshoppers and the crickets. Um, damage is going to be the grasshoppers, obviously, are going to devour leaves and stems. Uh, and the uh, crickets can eat organic matter, uh, but some crickets can affect the roots of plants as well. Uh, so here's the face of uh, just a grasshopper with the mandibles, the jaws. Uh, here's uh, the wings. So it's going to have the two pairs or two wings. And uh, uh, the ones that are a second pair may be colorful uh, or may not, depending on uh, the species. So here is a cricket. So this is the juvenile, juvenile stage, incomplete. So baby grasshoppers, baby crickets are going to look like the adults. Uh, I mentioned uh, some of you, uh, they are going to jump. That's going to be their first line of defense, but they can also fly. They're going to jump and try to hide and then uh, or drop to the ground. And if uh, last case uh, emergency, then they're going to fly away and uh, you're never going to catch them. And so in order for them to jump, they're going to have their rear legs uh, are going to be a lot stronger and bigger and there's going to be a lot of muscles. And that's why they're going to be very thick. Uh, so jumping and then flying would be the next one. Here's just a little tiny gra uh, grasshopper. And uh, you can determine or see the females because of that ovipositor. Um, grasshoppers and crickets are going to lay the eggs in the ground. Uh, and uh, that's when they're going to come out later on or when they hatch and they're going to spread out and begin to feed. So you have also what is known as a leaf grasshopper or sometimes known as a Katie did. I think it's a common name. So they're gonna mimic a leaf and that's what they're gonna try to hide uh, and, uh, and uh, pretend that they're a leaf so that nobody eats them. And this is uh, the side view of that. And then we have the mole cricket. And if you look at this one, uh, it's gonna have very sharp and almost their four legs are gonna be like a shovel because they're gonna dig tunnels. They, they grow or live underground. Uh, they'll come out at, ni at nighttime, just sometimes every so often you might see them, but most of their life is gonna be underground. Uh, and so they're gonna to have to dig a lot and that's why they have uh, these very strong hands more than uh, the others. So more crickets, they'll come out. Uh, here's the grasshopper and you can also see spines because when you catch them, they are gonna kick. They're gonna try to frighten you. They're not gonna draw blood. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then they're going to vomit on you. It's a gooey liquid. Uh, the kind of doesn't smell, but it's, it just feels um, bad. Uh, and so those are just mechanisms for you to release them uh, so that you don't kill them and they get a chance to live. No, no, it's just, just just a saliva. <laughs> uh, there's a side view of this one. So there's uh, the straight wings. So there they are at rest. Uh, there I'm holding it by the legs. So make sure it doesn't fly or jump. There's the face. Uh, there's the jaws and the face. And there's when it's on the leaf. So then the question becomes, what is the difference between a grasshopper and a locust? And the answer is there is no difference. It's the same thing. Uh, so what happens, and we know that locusts have done some really bad things for people in history. So once again, uh, people are monitoring for locust population uh, or, or grasshoppers population, usually in the, around the desert. So they monitor for their numbers because what happens if the grasshoppers 
population gets big, where once again, they're on top of each other, they're kicking each other, it's just, uh, it becomes very crowded, then there is a pheromone that it gets sent to them. And then what happens is that the pheromone is going to trigger for them to swarm to just fly away and find a different area. And uh, when they swarm, there's going to be humongous numbers. Uh, and they're going to follow each other. And that's when they're going to land on a field and mow it down to the ground. And that's where they're going to just keep on flying around. And when they ate the field, they made people go starve. So it is the population numbers that it triggers for them to become a swarm and fly out and destroy the field. And so by monitoring their population numbers, as soon as it gets to a certain threshold, then they can go there and treat with something, some pesticide to bring down their populations to prevent them from swarming. So a locust is nothing more than a swarming grasshopper. That's it. Otherwise, they're all the same. Uh, so this is a cricket uh, that we just found uh, growing happily. Uh, this one, very large leg. It lost one. Maybe it ain't got eaten by a bird. Uh, but here's that uh, ovipositor. So this is a female. So it has the egg laying apparatus. And there's uh, the close up of the cricket. Uh, cricket, female, with the ovipositor. Just grasshoppers, uh, uh, juvenile, here in very large numbers. Uh, and so are they bad? Again, in large numbers, they are, but most often it's just going to be one or two bites on a leaf, and most often you're never going to see them. Uh, it's also the fright that people, when they fry, they go up by their plant, they jump, jumps in the wrong direction, get some people's hair, and oh, it's a grasshopper. Uh, but their damage, unless they're swarming, is not really good. It's not going to be as bad. Uh, so that takes care of that. And then let's look at a few other obscure, obviously spiders uh, are, are, are always going to be good. Or this is Aranida, uh, which is the spiders and uh, uh, category. I'll know that the insects, but let's look at them. Eight legs, as we mentioned before. Uh, and but it also includes the mites, uh, spider mites and or aloe mites and or in this case, uh, there was a beetle that was having problems uh, right outside. It was kind of twitching. And I put it on the microscope and guess what? It has very tiny mites that were feeding on it. Uh, so those are small mites. Uh, so when you look at an insect, just look beyond just, hey, here's an insect because it could be something else that is living or feeding on it. And so, yeah, this one, uh, it died because of the mite infestation. Uh, so mites are going to be a problem, and those are going to be in the arachnid or in the arachnida or in this uh, spider category. Uh, banana spider right here with the eight legs. Uh, there's the face showing you also the kind of like the fangs that it uses uh, for injecting the digestive enzymes or the venom into uh, its prey, and so it gets liquefied. Um, spiders can also be communal, so this is where there's a humongous uh, uh, webbing. And in here, there's going to be thousands of uh, spiderlings and spiders that are going to live in a community. Uh, whatever gets caught gets shared among the, all of them. And so there's, you see, many spiders happily living together. Uh, there's a two-spotted spider mite, very common around here. Uh, almost any plant out there has this spider mite. Uh, they're going to be very small. Uh, this is going to be the, pre, uh, the, pre, the pest, so it's going to feed on plants. Uh, and the other thing that I want you to start looking at is the speed of the insect, because sometimes you might see, uh, might be looking through the microscope, and you see a mite running across the microscope very quickly those are going to be most likely the predatory because they're going to have to hunt down their prey. Whereas the plant feeding, since plants don't move, they're not going to be very fast. So start looking for differences in speed that is going to help you to determine whether that mite, whether that insect is a beneficial or it may be the 
uh, past uh, those feet. Uh, so there's the mite with a microscope, uh, the mite with their eggs. And so you have the eggs and you can also see the damage. So they're gonna use the fangs to uh, probe or stab uh, the leaves, the cells of the leaves. They're gonna drink the content, uh, the chlorophyll and everything else. And in the process, destroy the green pigment. And that's when you have the silvering as a indicator. Uh, there's four scale. Uh, there's my blue millimeter uh, scale. So there's a size of the mite, very, very tiny. And mites will make webbing because they are spider-like. So they can make a web just like spiders for protection. Here's uh, jumping spiders, kind of mimicking, hiding amongst the cacti, uh, prickles, just waiting for its prey. Uh, there's uh, a clover and just showing you how small those mites can be, uh, so spider mites. So that's them right there and some of the damage. Uh, and then we have a sun spider. Uh, this is uh, what's found here up uh, Signal Hill. So this is a wild animal. Uh, so they can bite like all spiders and they all just run around. And uh, if you lift some of the rocks, they may be hiding underneath it. So if you've never seen it, just go up Signal Hill, pick up a few rocks, be careful. And you might find uh, a sun spider. And spiders are also delicious. So these are brought for me from Cambodia. So seasoned to perfection and uh, uh, they were very, very good. So people in different cultures will eat spiders as well. Uh, there's the spider with no legs. And so you can just remove the cholesterol or the fangs if you want, but not necessary. And then you chew 30 times and swallow, delicious. Uh, here's uh, some of the spiders that will make that orb web or the webbing. Uh, those are, there's going to be a few of them. Others are going to make a webbing in the crevices, others on the wall. Uh, but there's a specific one that makes the, the orb webbing. Uh, and there's going to be the tarantulas. So this is one of the largest tarantulas that I encounter. Uh, uh, here's uh, just a garden spider uh, uh, normally. If they don't make a wave, a wave, a web, uh, they're gonna seek out their prey. And when they see it, they may bounce or pounce upon it uh, or just, uh, and then they kill it. Uh, so this, another spider just hanging out by this light uh, with a beetle. And so here's the orb web. So you see the web that is gonna be very sticky. Obviously that's where the insect's gonna get caught. Uh, more of that communal spiders. Uh, South America, and there's uh, all of them, different ages, different stages. And these are uh, spider mites when an infestation gets really bad. Uh, this is a morning glory. The whole leaf is covered with the webbing, mites, and everything else. Now there's hardly any green on the leaf because it's all been destroyed. And there's a growing tip covered with spider mites. Uh, so, the problem. Spider, 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 spider. Another orb uh, spider. Another, this one with uh, spikes on its rear end and then the front end. And so this is uh, the tarantula. So it was walking, it was happy. And then uh, I kicked some sand and then it went into the, I'm gonna bite you more. Uh, so, Tarantula's uh, venom is not that strong. Uh, it's uh, it's going to, first line of defense uh, is going to be to brush off the hairs from its back. And the hairs are going to fall, no, I'm going to say a bird. Uh, they're going to land on their uh, eyes and nose and it's not going to be uh, good for them. So that may deter them. And then as a last defense, they're going to use their uh, their bite. Uh, but the hairs were sold as itching powder for many, many years. It was literally tarantula hair that were ground up and that was the itchy powder that you would put somebody's back and then start itching. So it's just a defense mechanism. So tarantulas, mites, uh, mites, ticks, spiders. So those are gonna be in that category. Ticks, mites, spiders. And we do have aloe mites that nobody has brought over to find them. We've seen uh, beetles, diplopora. 
So this is going to be uh, millipedes and centipedes. Okay, so it's a diplopoda and a kilopoda. So two of them. So you either have millipedes or centipedes. Uh, diplopoda means uh, two legs. And so here's the difference. Uh, when you have a millipede, uh, they're going to be vegetarian. Millipedes are going to be vegetarian. And when you look at each body segment, they're going to have four legs. So two legs on each side of the body segment. And that's why diplopoda means, means two, two legs. Because they are vegetarian, uh, when you try to grab them or when they're going to be in danger, they're going to roll into this ball and they're going to use their exoskeleton as protection. Uh, you can buy them as a pet if you wish, uh, but that's going to be the millipede. They feed on organic matter. They feed on some younger plants. They are not really considered a pest. Uh, they're just good kind of, not good guys, but just uh, free living organisms in the soil. Uh, so here's uh, what looks like a centipede, but let's get a better picture of that one. So centipedes are going to be carnivorous, and there's going to be chilopera, where the front legs are going to be modified into a fang. Uh, centipedes are going to have one leg on each segment. And uh, consider all centipedes to be very dangerous. Now, the ones that we have here are very small, so they are going to be harmless. But the ones that you get from Vietnam and some tropical countries where there are a couple of inches in length, uh, the people, when they see them, they run away from them. Why? Because if they happen to get on you, they can then use those fangs to bite you and inject a really horrible toxin but they can also use every single one of those legs to also stab you and inject a very terrible uh, toxin. Uh, they are predators, so they'll pounce and uh, uh, hunt their prey and will use that, uh, the toxins to kind of paralyze it or kill it, and then they will eat it. So millipedes, when you lift the rock, they're gonna go into the ball. Centipedes, when you lift the rock, they're gonna run away. And they're going to be fast. Once again, predator versus just an herbivore. Uh, so here's a millipede. So two legs on each side of the segment. Uh, and you can see a lot of them. Uh, here's a close-up of it. They do have an antenna. Uh, but there's the two legs on each segment. Uh, that's it. Looks like a centipede, most likely. Uh, centipede, question? No, there's around here, they're like about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Yes, 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 yes. They're, they're going to be thicker and they're going to be longer because they will have to stab you. Whereas the millipede are going to have those very tiny, tiny legs just to kind of walk around and move around. But yes, the, the length of the leg and the thickness is going to be very different. Uh, centipede here, uh, millipede just doing his things, hiding, don't eat me. Uh, so those are two things, millipede, centipede. So if you find them, uh, let's bring them in. Lift some rocks. You'll see them. They're around here. Uh, we've seen diptera, hemiptera, homoptera, hymenoptera, isoptera. We're going to lump the two categories. Uh, you have uh, the closely related uh, uh, roaches and uh, termites. So here's a termite, uh, that's gonna be Isoptera, and then uh, the old uh, Blatoli, uh, Blatora would be the roaches. Uh, so Isoptera, we've already gotten both of them here in the class. So termites are obviously gonna be wood feeders, so they're gonna feed on wood and they're gonna cause a lot of damage to the structures and the homes. Uh, and that's when it's going to require for you to tent your house and uh, kill them. Around here, we have two types of termites. We have the dry wood. So if you happen to pick up a log like Ray, 
uh, in the in the Vaughan, uh, and you see the termites living inside the wood in tunnels. Then those are the dry uh, those are the dry wood. So they feed on wood and they live inside the wood or the stem. The termites have a fungi in their stomach, and it is the fungi that digest the wood. Uh, and then uh, the termites absorb the vitamins and the minerals. Uh, termites are often confused with bees, wasps, uh, because they may have a similar body. They also have the caste system. They have the king and the queen, and they also have large colonies where they will build a kind of like a hive or a home out of big uh, mounds in Africa and in other tropical countries. Yes, there is a true behind uh, a war of between termites and ants that exists. Uh, and there's also the truth that ants fight with one another and wars, that is true. That is one of the biggest enemies of uh, different ant colonies, other ants. Uh, so the termites are going to uh, go to the wood and eat it. So the other group or the other termite that you're gonna find around here uh, is known as a subterranean termite. And those live in the ground. And they are gonna be the worst ones because what's gonna happen, they are gonna make a mud tunnel from the ground up into the walls of your house. And at some point where they find an open uh, wood, then they're gonna start eating it and then they're gonna move inside. So they build this tunnel uh, where you're not gonna see it underneath the house or inside the house and the understory on the side to keep them moist because they are susceptible to drying out. And so by having this tunnel, it protects them. They move in and out of your house, they eat, but they live in the ground. And so when somebody's doing a termite inspection, they look underneath the house, they'll light up the area and they can see the tunnels going from your, the ground to your house. And then they know that you have some, some subterranean termites. For the dry wood, the ones that live in the house, obviously they will tent it. You have to fumigate them, you have to kill them. Uh, for the subterranean, uh, they can put a long residual herb, uh, pesticide along the, boy base of your house that will prevent the, the subterranean from going up from the ground up to your house. So different treatment depending on which ones uh, you have. So, but there's only two subterranean uh, and or dry wood uh, termites and Paulette brought the dry wood, sorry, the subterranean, Ray got the dry wood. Uh, and uh, during the, the spring when it's nice and moist, uh, or the humid day, maybe there's a little bit of mist, maybe it's uh, nice and cool you will see the subterraneans come out of the ground in very large numbers with wings. Those are the future kings and queens and they'll fly to the air, they'll mate. And then uh, once they mate, they find a nice place to dig if they're subterranean or they happen to find a tree with some kind of exposed wood, they'll begin to burrow into it and that's gonna be their home uh, for that cast. So, and once again, no waistline. Uh, so this is a termite. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So, and then the roaches, cockroaches, uh, there's going to be three main ones that we're going to find here in uh, Southern California. There's going to be the American cockroach, there's going to be the Oriental cockroach, or there's going to be the German cockroach. The American is sometimes referred to as water bugs, but we know what a water bug is. Uh, but the American is gonna be the biggest one. And I hear I heard that in Texas, there's a competition for who can get the biggest uh, water bug or American cockroach. Uh, the Oriental is gonna be the second biggest one or the middle one. And the small one that has uh, stripes or two stripes on its back of its thorax, uh, is gonna be the German. So the little one is gonna be German, the medium is the Oriental, the biggest one is the American. The roaches are gonna be nocturnal. So they're gonna be a come out night and they are good at sensing light and they are good at sensing vibration. So they're gonna wait for you to go home and once, uh, sorry, to go to sleep 
And once you go to sleep, then they're gonna come out and scour your kitchen for any crumbs, anything that you left behind. If you don't have anything to behind for them to eat, they're gonna eat the glue from books, they're gonna eat paper, they're gonna survive on almost anything. Uh, every single home has roaches. If you don't see them, it's because they come out at night. They love areas that are nice and warm. So they prefer or they like to make their homes in the back of computers, in the old computers that were running that was nice and warm, or the fridge that is running and is nice and warm. Uh, that's where they like to make their home. So what's, uh, and you normally, normally see them next to the wall. Uh, roaches don't feel safe in the middle of a room because uh, they're just exposed. So what's gonna happen is that they're gonna move their antenna around to feel and see, and they're gonna use the wall to guide them. And so that's why you see them along the wall and they can run very fast and they can also fly, all of them. The problem comes when you get up in the morning or in the middle of the day and you see a roach running across. So then what is the problem? The problem is that every single crevice where they like to sleep is so crowded that now they're outside during the time when they're not supposed to. So use that as an indicator. Normally they come out at night. They don't like to be out in the daytime. Uh, lift uh, some of those uh, boxes for irrigation. They sleep underneath there or inside there. They don't like, they like the darkness and they'll come out at night from the sewers, from the gutters, they'll be out. Uh, so you don't want to see them during the daytime, not because they're ugly, but because it tells you that you have a lot of roaches in your house. Uh, but these are some of the uh, wild roaches uh, that I just came across, uh, a lot more pretty uh, than uh, the standard ones that you might see around here, uh, including that one um, from South America. And uh, this one I did not kill, so that is a termite. Uh, from uh, the tropics, a lot bigger than what you have here, uh, that I was able to take a photograph so I can show you, show you the difference, obviously from a wasp, uh, and then another tiny roach, and then some of the termites that are, these ones are collecting uh, leaf litter and debris, and they were carrying it back to their nest, almost like an ant, so they're behaving like ants, and this is in uh, South Africa, I think. And there they are. So they're collecting uh, this, uh, the straw. So this one is carrying the straw. And uh, obviously, if you have your uh, wood uh, uh, living uh, termites, the frost is going to be your main indicator. Uh, and that's when people realize, oh, I got termites. But I can guarantee you every home in Long Beach has termites. Uh, so it, it takes some time for their populations to build. And so when people go in and uh, tent your house, they usually sell you a guarantee for a year, maybe two, that if you find a termite between those that time, then uh, they'll come and spray for or tent for free again. And the thing is that the law requires for them to treat correctly. Uh, and it takes about a year or a little bit more than a year for the population to go back to uh, a big number where you're going to notice them. And so they're selling you an insurance that they're supposed to already do it. And you're not going to find a termite in the meantime because the population is not big enough. So it's kind of like a scam marketing type thing. Go ahead. The termites are everywhere. Well, where there's wood, because they feed on wood. So where there's wood, uh, there's going to be termites because that's their job to break down wood. Yeah. And they're doing their job. There's a dead log and it's going to prepare it for being uh, destroyed, decay. And there's a house that's made out of wood. They're going to have dead wood and they're going to do their job. Uh, we've seen that one. Uh, let's look at uh, the praying mantis or the mantida. Uh, mantis that can also look like a leaf. Uh, and mantis are going to be uh, predators, and they're often going to be sold uh, as a biological control, but they're not going to be as good as other forms. And that is because 
uh, the praying mantis are going to be, they're going to eat everything. So they're going to, if they catch another mantis, they're going to eat it. Uh, if they catch a beneficial, they're going to eat it. Uh, if they catch a pest, they're going to eat it. So they're not going to be selective as to what they're going to eat. So whatever they can catch, they're going to eat. So some of them may look like a leaf as a disguise. They're going to wait for their prey to get close. Uh, and there's a side view of that. Uh, and then uh, what you can look for is going to be the front legs. The front legs that are going to be modified into being more of a raptorial, like a raptor, uh, raptorial hands. So they're going to lash out into their prey. They're going to trap them with their hands. They do have uh, spines or extensions that are going to stab the insect and hold it in place as they eat it. So the raptorial hands, the very first one, is going to be a good indicator that it is a wasp. So a wasp, <laughs> a praying mantis or a mantis. Uh, so here's uh, the raptorial hands being used for walking, trying to climb the wall. Uh, here that you can see them like quite clearly. Uh, so there's the hands uh, or the second leg, the first pair of legs, and there's the very strong, sharp claws. Uh, so it is a, a known fact that females will have to kill their mate. Uh, and, uh, and or the male praying mantis is gonna sacrifice itself to the female. Uh, what happens is that when the male is going to mate uh, with the female, obviously he has to be very careful because she can just grab him and eat him, no problem. Uh, females are going to be bigger. Uh, but in order for the male to ejaculate, the female has to cut the nerve cord from the head. So it is a requirement. Otherwise, he cannot ejaculate and fertilize the female. So the first thing that the female is going to do is going to decapitate it and eat the head. Then as it's eating the head, now the male is going to complete its uh, thing. It's a life cycle. It's going to fertilize the egg, uh, the female. And then there's no point in uh, wasting a very good uh, protein diet that is going to give the female a lot of vitamins and minerals for her offspring. So then the male is sacrificing itself so that the younglings or her future generation are going to be already well fed and nourished. And so the female is going to eat the male praying mantis. It has to. So that's, that's going to happen. So you may hear about it. So it is a biological requirement. I guess we're going to say that for that to happen. Uh, so here's uh, just a couple of them that may look like uh, stick insects or a six. Uh, it's another leaf uh, mantis. Uh, there's a raptorio in the face. Uh, this would be a youngling that you can find around here. I think this is South Coast Botanic Garden. Uh, and this is one in Baja. I was able uh, to photograph and you can see the spikes on those uh, raptorio hands. So do not buy those egg cases. Uh, it's just, they, they eat everything. Uh, so praying mantis, mantis. And they sell them as beneficial. Yeah, not, not the best one. Uh, then the next one is going to be Odonata, which is uh, damselflies and or dragonflies. Uh, two big difference. Uh, the damselflies, when they are going to be resting, their wings are going to be held upright. And this one happens to be mating. They will mate in flight. Uh, they'll uh, go and look for pollen and nectar, uh, and they're going to mate. Uh, the adults are going to be able to fly, and they're good flyers, very strong, very fast. The juvenile or the nymph is going to be underwater, and they can feed on tadpoles, they can feed on insects, they can feed on what, small fish, whatever else they can catch. So they're normally going to be associated with some kind of water, uh, river, lake, because of the need for the young the need for the youngs to be in water. Uh, so this is when they're mating. Now, this is the dragonfly. And if you look at the wings of the dragonfly, when it's resting, the wings are going to be held on either side. So wings on either side, much, much beefier, huskier, then it's a dragonfly. Wings on, uh, held upright on top of the body, very slender, petite, then it's gonna be a damselfly. 
Uh, they are carnivorous, so the dragonfly will chase and outfly insects, catch them on the fly, eat them. Uh, juvenile, also carnivorous, catching whatever it can, it can underwater. So there's a top view of a dragonfly with the wings held on either side. And uh, look at the eyes. It can see in every direction. Uh, so you will never catch this insect off guard. The best thing, try to catch it in the early morning when it's cold and it's not as fast. At 12 o'clock p.m., you will not catch a dragonfly because it can see you, it can fly, it can get away from you. Uh, and this is uh, the nymph. Uh, so when they just barely came out uh, from the water, so they will climb up the vegetation, they'll come out of the water on rocks, and then they, just like we saw in the sequera, uh, they will burst out of their shell and they'll come out as an adult. Uh, and then they're gonna leave behind just this exoskeleton uh, that's gonna drop. So that's, that's what's gonna happen. And then they become airborne and out into the air. All right, and then uh, fourth chapter we saw, uh, Phasmanthi is going to be the stick insects. And uh, we're only looking at stick insects because apparently there's a couple of those pets that have escaped. Uh, one that feeds on roses. And I guess it's, uh, it's it, they, they are on the watch list because they are vegetarian. They will defoliate plants or eat leaves. Uh, and I guess in certain areas, they have escaped from being pets and they have become established. So otherwise, most often you're gonna see them as a cutesy pet for children, uh, but they are carnivorous. Uh, they're stick insects because they're gonna mimic a stick. Uh, and uh, as they walk, they're gonna sway back and forth as if the wind uh, is moving the plants or when you blow at them, they're gonna move left uh, but forward with the vegetation because they're, Mimic has to be perfect. They don't have that raptorial hand and they walk very slowly. So separates them from the mantis uh, by those two different things. Uh, so here's some of the adults that are gonna be a little bit bigger, or here's one that happens to land or was hiding on a, uh, the mirror of uh, one of the cars. So very slender. So stick insects, they look like sticks. Do we have uh, stick insects in California? The answer is yes, we do have native stick insects. They're not gonna be anywhere near the size of uh, the pets or the tropical, but if you happen to see them, catch them and uh, bring them in. So I think that's it, right? So that's it for the group. The rest uh, are gonna be beneficial and we'll see them at a later. So I got a color. No, we see that, those are beetles. Uh, that's it. So any other questions? Uh, so then let's stop recording.